Hey there, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third video on uh, momentum. So we've learned a little bit about momentum and impulse so far, and now it's really going to all come together into um, one of the sort of fundamental uh, laws of physics, which is the law of conservation of momentum. And so this is going to be really useful for uh, describing anytime there's in, an interaction between two objects, right? Like a bowling ball hitting a bowling pin or two cars colliding or or something where one object runs into another. Um, we're going to be able to describe the motion before and after um, by looking at the momentum of the two objects. So where this all comes from, if you recall back to Newton's laws, Newton's third law says for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. And so if you push on your friend, automatically they are pushing back. If you hit a baseball with a bat, the bat hits the ball and the ball hits the bat. Every action has a reaction and those forces have to be equal. So while the bat hits the ball and pushes it, say forward, the ball is actually pushing the bat backwards. Now that's not to say that they both behave the same way, and that's because they have different masses and so on, but the force that they exert on one another is going to be the same, but in opposite directions. So two colliding objects experience equal and opposite forces. But if you think about it, they must experience them for the same amount of time. So the ball is hitting the bat for the exact same amount of time that the bat is hitting the ball for the time that they're in contact. So they impact each other for the same amount of time. So then their impulses, if impulse is going to be net force times time, their impulses must be equal and opposite. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the baseball must, must change the momentum of the bat and the bat must change the momentum of the ball and those two changes in momentum must be equal and opposite. And so this leads us to the law of conservation of momentum which basically says that in any sort of closed system, the total change in momentum has to be zero. And so recall that a change in anything, so a change in momentum, for example, would be momentum final minus momentum initial. And so if that whole thing is going to equal zero, then that means if I just move momentum initial to the other side, so momentum initial must equal momentum final. So basically, whatever momentum you start with in a system, that total, if you look at that total system in the end, after some sort of interaction, that total amount of momentum must stay constant. And um, this can be a little bit confusing, right? Like if you think about an example where like, oh, if somebody throws a baseball at me and I catch it, well, I, I stop the baseball. So I've just caught the baseball and all that baseball's momentum, it seems to disappear. But don't forget that while you're standing there, you are attached to the earth. And so because there's friction between your feet and the ground, you don't slide. And so really when you catch the baseball, the baseball's momentum is absorbed by not just you, but really the entire earth. And of course the earth is a big place, so you don't really notice it shifting. But um, basically, if we start with this premise that the initial momentum has to equal the final momentum, then we can expand this out. Um, to say that basically M1 V1 initial, so the initial momentum of the first object, plus M2 V2 initial, the initial momentum of the second object, has to equal M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. So if I find all the initial momentum and add it up, and I find all the final momentum and add it up, they have to be the same thing. And so basically what we're saying here is that an isolated, an isolated system, by an isolated system we mean there are no, um, means a system with no external forces. So you might think about it as like a closed system, you talk about a closed system in chemistry. Um, yeah, and so if we're only worried about the forces that the two objects exert on each other, then our momentum is conserved. So there are three kinds of uh, sort of interactions that we'll look at where momentum is going to be really useful for us to um, explore. And the first is a collision between two objects that don't stick together. Now, um, when two objects don't stick together, you could imagine that baseball bat hitting a ball or a golf club hitting a, a golf ball or um, a basketball hitting the floor and bouncing up. These are all examples where um, there's a collision, but the objects don't remain stuck together. 
Very generally, we might call these elastic collisions. And the technical definition of an elastic collision is that kinetic energy is conserved. So we know that overall total energy has to be conserved, but in an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved. So an example of that might be, imagine like a, a bouncy ball kind of falling, and as it falls, right before it hits the ground, it has a certain speed, and then it hits the ground, and if it was like some perfect magical bouncy ball, it might bounce up with the exact same speed. So the kinetic energy that it hit the ground with, it bounces up with the exact same amount of kinetic energy. That would be a perfectly elastic collision. Um, the reality is, is that very few collisions are actually going to be perfectly elastic. So in the macroscopic world, when things collide, a little bit of energy is always uh, potentially lost due to heat or vibrations or sound or some other form. The only time you'll see a truly elastic collision might be between, say, two particles, two protons that collide and bounce off each other, something like that. So we're going to set these problems up in a um, in kind of a we're going to have a bit of a plan for how we do this, and this will be the same for each of our different um, types of problems. So a 7.1 kilogram bowling ball <clears throat> is rolling to the right at 3.8 meters per second when it collides with a stationary 0.4 kilogram bowling pin. After the collision, the bowling ball is traveling at 2.9 meters per second to the right. How fast is the pin moving after the collision? So we're going to set this up with like a little before and after picture. So here is my before and here is my after. So we're going to test your art skills here. So before the collision, I've kind of got this bowling ball rolling along this way, and it's kind of heading for this bowling pin, which sort of looks like that, sort of, which isn't really moving. So this is M1, and it has a V1 initial. And this is M2, and it has a V2 initial. Now after the collision, so there's some sort of collision happens, and the bowling ball after the collision is still rolling this way, it's just slowed down a little bit. And the bowling pin, you could sort of imagine the bowling pin being hit by the ball, you could imagine it um, is gonna go flying off this way. So we can kind of presume that's what's gonna happen. And I've got an M1 and a V1 final, and I've got an M2 and a V2 final. So this is just gonna help us organize kind of all of our thinking. M1, we can see here, that's our bowling ball. So that's 7.1 kilograms, whoops, my mistake. 7.1 kilograms. The bowling pin is only 0 0.40 kilograms. The initial uh, velocity of the ball is 3.8 meters per second. And the initial velocity of the bowling pin, well, if it's just sitting there, then the initial velocity of the bowling pin is zero. Um, I'm not going to bother rewriting my masses here because they didn't change in this case. We might see a case where they do change, and then I'll worry about that then. But we do know that the bowling ball's velocity um, has slowed down to 2.9 meters per second. And then the bowling pin's velocity, well, that's what we don't know. So we've got all of our, all of our variables all organized and laid out here. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, go to our law of conservation of momentum, which says M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. It's kind of a mouthful. So, um, right, so first thing I would suggest is when we look at this, um, often there's an there's a opportunity to simplify it. So when we look at our equation, we want to see if there's anything that we can make easier on ourselves. And I can see here that since my initial velocity of the pin is zero, since the pin doesn't start with any momentum, then this whole thing is going to be zero. Because zero, it doesn't matter what the mass is, if I multiply it by zero velocity, it has no momentum. Basically, the bowling ball starts with all momentum and then it shares some with the bowling pin afterwards. So now I can, uh, I'm gonna do some algebra. And so I can uh, solve here, what I'm trying to solve for is V2 final. So I'm gonna subtract M1 V1 initial. So I get M1 V1 initial, pardon me, minus M1. Uh, M1 V1 final equals M2 V2 final, and then I'm gonna divide everything by M2, and I get V2 final equals M1 V1 initial minus M1 V1 final all over M2. Now, um, the algebra is not that bad. 
I know you can probably put this in your calculator, but it is really, really useful before you just hammer it into your calculator and get an answer, just to kind of have a bit of a thought about what your answer is likely to be. When I look at this, I see that the, the bowling ball only slowed down by one meter per second. So its momentum didn't really seem to change by too much. But you know what? I'm actually expecting a pretty big final velocity here because this bowling ball slowing down by even just one meter per second it's a really big object compared to the bowling pin. So this bowling ball losing um, one meter per second is actually gonna mean kind of a lot of momentum being transferred to that bowling pin. So I'm expecting kind of a larger final velocity, which sort of makes sense if you've ever hit a bowling pin with a bowling ball. So I've got um, 7.1 times 3.8 minus 7.1 times uh, 2.9. And I'm gonna divide that by 0 0.40 and so if we calculate this okay so we can do this in two steps I might just do the top first 7.1 times 3.8 you could see there we could do a little bit of factoring and make our lives easier but well I was too slow I didn't notice it so that I'm gonna divide this uh, I'm gonna divide this by 0 0.40 Four, zero, and I get my answer of about 16 meters per second. Um, which kind of makes sense. That's a lot faster than the bowling ball, ball was going, but then the bowling pin is a lot smaller than the bowling ball, so that kind of works out. Now, the other thing I want to point out here that I kind of skipped over, and you're going to see it in this next example over here, um, is that what's really useful about laying everything out like this, all of these variables, is that I need you to notice that those velocities are vectors and so their direction is going to matter in this case the bowling ball was going to the right the bowling pin was going to the right and everything was easy but if you have something that's going to the left then you need to assign that a negative velocity so keep that in mind i want you to go ahead and try this one on your own and we'll go over the answer in class but give that next one give that next one a go and see how you do okay um, I'm going to skip ahead to uh, the next type of problem. So this is where we've got uh, some sort of collision and our objects are going to stick together. So any collision where the objects stick together is going to be called an inelastic, an inelastic collision. And so of course what that means is my kinetic energy is not conserved. Okay, and so you know, most real world collisions are at least somewhat inelastic. If, if it's perfectly inelastic, then the two objects actually become stuck together. You could imagine maybe a collision between two cars where the two cars are actually intertwined after the collision. Or in this example here where you've got somebody catching a hockey puck and so the hockey puck's moving and then they grab onto it and so they're, they're now stuck together. So anytime two things are stuck together, that would be sort of perfectly inelastic. And it doesn't mean that all of our kinetic energy is gone. It just means that it's, it's not conserved. So uh, we're going to draw a picture of this one. So we've got a, a hockey puck moving at 48 meters per second is caught by a goalie at rest. Imagining that the ice is frictionless, at what velocity will the goalie slide on the ice after catching the puck? So if there was no friction, none at all, then when you catch a hockey puck, you'd actually start sliding backwards. So let's, uh, let's draw a picture. So I got a hockey puck. Okay and it's kind of flying this way and then I've got a goalie so you know not to scale or anything excellent this is definitely what a goalie looks like perfect okay so the goalie is just kind of sitting there and then after the collision the goalie is going to catch the puck Maybe they make a spectacular save. All right. And they catch this novelty oversized puck. Good catch. Okay. So in this case, I've got M1 and V1 initial, and then I've got M2 and V2 initial. But over on the final side of things, well, if the goalie catches the puck, then they're kind of stuck together whatever speed the puck's going at, the goalie's going at as well. So I'm gonna think of them as one object. I'm just gonna call this M total and V final. And so M1, the puck, 
uh, 0.105 is moving at 48 meters per second. And the goalie, 75 kilograms, moving at zero meters per second. And then the goalie is going to catch the puck. And so I guess the total mass would be 75.105 kilograms. And we want to know what is their final velocity. So the law of conservation of momentum, I'm going to modify it slightly in this case where I've got an inelastic collision because the two objects stick together. The start is going to look the same. So I've got M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals. But if the two objects are stuck together, then instead of having them separate, I'll just treat them as one thing. So M total times V final. And now I'm going to look for V final. So just doing some algebra, I guess all I need to do is divide uh, M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial and divide that by M total. Now I can actually see here that I didn't take my own advice. I got a little excited and got ahead of myself because I should have looked to see if I could cancel anything out. Sure enough, my initial velocity here for the goalie is zero. So I could have just actually canceled that out right from the get go. Just get rid of that um, and then it makes my life a little bit easier. So V final will equal M1 V1 initial over M total. And again, before I put this in my calculator and just believe what answer it gives me, I can think about how fast the goalie is going to move. Well, the puck's moving pretty fast, but the goalie is much, much bigger than the puck is. So while I can see that they would start drifting backwards, I can't imagine it's going to be very fast at all. And so um, M1 would be 0 0.105 times 48, and I'm going to divide that by my total mass of 75.105. And then let's put this in the calculator and see what we get. So 0 0.105 times 48 divided by 75.105 and I get, mm, yeah, not very fast at all, 0 0.067. Which, that's pretty slow, but you know what? That kind of makes sense because, um, you know, I guess there is a little bit of friction on ice, but not that much. If goalies went flying backwards every time they tried to stop a puck, then I don't think hockey uh, would exist. So again, what I want you to do is I want you to try, think about that same thing, I want you to try and do um, this problem here with that same sort of logic, and we'll go over that in class. And um, now the last example I wanna talk about is an explosion. And for an explosion, um, you know, this is a situation where uh, it's not a collision. It's not two objects coming together and then colliding and interacting. It's actually a single object that starts sort of as one object and then it explodes into two or potentially more pieces as they kind of separate. So a 0 0.050 kilogram bullet is fired from a gun. The velocity of the, of the bullet is 275 meters per second. What's the recoil velocity of the gun? So I'm gonna draw my before and my after picture. Okay, so I've got a gun that looks suspiciously like a hairdryer, okay? And there's a bullet in it. And then after the, um, after the explosion, after the, the gun fires, the bullet is going this way. And I can kind of infer from that that if the bullet's going forwards, then the gun is going to recoil uh, backwards. So how is this going to change my setup? Well, initially the object was all together. So I've got an M1, or sorry, an M total and a V initial. I'm not going to call them M1 and 2. They're all just sort of together to start with. So the total mass would be 5.050 kilograms and the initial velocity would be zero. And then I've got M1, the gun, and M2, the bullet. So V1 final and V2 final. So the gun has a mass of five kilograms. The bullet has a mass of 0 0.50 kilograms. The gun's recoil velocity, I don't know, that's what I'm trying to find. And the bullet's velocity is 275 meters per second. So think about how your conservation of momentum formula is gonna change. Well, in this case, if the objects start all together, then we're gonna have a total mass times an initial velocity, and that's gonna equal M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. 
Now I'll take my own advice this time. I'll actually listen and take a look and see that my initial velocity here is zero. And so I can cancel that out. And then, so I'm gonna have a little bit of a simpler time here. Zero equals M1 V1 final plus M2, M2 V2 final. So solving for V1 final, I'll just jump to the end here. V1 final is gonna equal negative M2 V2 final divided by M1. So again, before I put this in my calculator, I'm gonna kind of make an estimate here. I'm gonna guess that the gun's recoil is gonna be much smaller than the bullet because, uh, well, because it's so much bigger. And so whatever momentum the bullet gets forward, the gun is gonna get backwards, but that much momentum will translate into a slower velocity just because of the, the mass differential. So I've got negative times M2, 0 0.050 times 275, and I'm gonna divide that by the mass of the gun. 5.0 and take a look at my calculator. Now for those of you playing along at home, you probably already know the answer. You can divide this in your head because you notice the shortcut. This is actually just 2.75 meters per second. And actually it comes out as a negative. And, and you want to think to yourself, well, why is it negative? Like, where is that negative? What does that negative sign mean? Well, that just refers to the fact that the gun recoiled Backwards, So the recoil velocity of the gun is going to be negative 2.75 because it's going to go in the backwards direction. Okay, so that's it for law of conservation of momentum. Again, you've got some examples for you to try and, and test, your, uh, test your understanding. And we'll, uh, we'll do the rest in class. All right, take care.